Have you seen the movie Crash? I think it was shot in 1995 or something. The reason why I ask is because there are at least two stories in the movie that are taken or based upon the storyline of the plot of the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll give you one. It's when the police officer comes upon the car crash scene. He plays the Samaritan and the person trapped inside the car is the person who's robbed and left half naked along the side of the road. Now the test comes. Can you find the other instance of the Good Samaritan parable in this movie? If so, leave your thoughts and comments below and let's see how good you are. The reason why I mention this is because the parable of the Good Samaritan is one of Jesus' best known parables and has been told and retold thousands of times down through the Western tradition. As a result, we don't see this parable as powerful and provocative any longer, but more of a moral story be like the Good Samaritan. What I'd like to do in this video is dive back into my archives and bring a video I did on the parable of the Good Samaritan forward. We're going to explore the grammar and literary features of this parable. Hopefully this will allow us to recover some of the original power it had for the early church and at the same time allow this parable to speak with a fresh voice and strike our hearts anew today. So grab a cup of coffee, let's dive in. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching graduate level theological studies for about the past 20 to 30 years around the world. And the, the goal, goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and make it available to a much wider audience. Now, the context for this story is important. At the end of Luke chapter 9, Jesus has sent out his disciples and they've come back and they're very frustrated with the Samaritans. In fact, they want to call down fire upon the Samaritan villages. The second thing that's important to realize about this is that what sets this parable in motion is a young lawyer asking Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It involves issues about what is the nature of the kingdom of God? How am I to behave here on this earth? How do I follow the precepts of the Old Testament and the Torah and apply them to my lives? And then Jesus asks him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then turns to him and says, do this and you shall live. Now hold on to that, that sentence of do this and you shall live, because we're going to see where that comes in later in the parable. He then follows up with a second question, who then is my neighbor? Now the text tells us that he wants to justify himself. This is really a question about how do I follow the law? How do I live a righteous life? Because this is what's involved in receiving eternal life. The second thing is this question about who then is my neighbor defines the limits of how far I extend God's love. Does it go to this person or that person? How far out does it go before I'm no longer obligated to share God's love with that person? Or we could put it another way. How far does community go? Now, this is perhaps one of the most difficult things for us as human beings, because we always like to draw boundary lines about who is in and who is out. You look at immigration policies and how there's such a fierce debate over who we let in and who we let out, because we've got this predefined notion about who's in, who should be in, and who we're going to let in to our country or our community. During Jesus' day, this was the same issue. Who is in my village? Who is in my religious community? Who do I share God's love with? And these issues are fundamental to just about every human being alive on the face of the earth. Now, what's interesting here is that Laura has just asked one question. What should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him an answer. But then when he gives the second one, who then is my neighbor? Jesus doesn't give him a propositional answer. Instead, he tells him a story. He presents him with a parable, which allows him to enter into the story, work out the ramifications and the network within the story, and then realize the answer to his question so that when he comes out of the parable on the other end, hopefully he will have a different perspective than what he went into the parable with. So let's take a look at this parable. It begins in verse 30, and we're going to kind of walk through this line by line. 
verse 30 starts off with, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now, there's a couple of things that are very important in this verse. The first thing is a certain man. This is very, very generic. We don't know if this man is young or old. We don't know if he's Jewish, Samaritan, Greek, Roman. We know nothing about him. But remember, Jesus is telling this to the lawyer. And so from his perspective, I think he would have filled in the blanks and seen this person as a member of the Jewish community. But it doesn't necessarily need to be that. It can be much wider than that. I think it's left open to create a vagueness in the story. The second thing is he's on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this gives us a path to follow in the narrative. The third thing is what happens to him. He falls among robbers who stripped him, beat him, departed, leaving him half dead. First off, they stripped him. Now, this is significant to the story because clothing often identified who you were. So to be stripped makes this person even more generic. There is no sort of visible markers on his body that he's wearing to identify who he is. The second thing is they beat him and they leave him half dead. This person is naked, lying on the side of the road. You know, whether this guy could even get up on an elbow and cry out for help as people walked by is doubtful. I kind of see him as semi-conscious. He might be able to open his eyes or something like this. Deprived of some of the most basic human necessities, that of clothing and dignity. And he has everything that he has has been taken away from him. So this is the condition in which our central character finds himself in in the story. Then we have three characters that come after him. Now notice the grammatical pattern that Jesus uses when he tells this story. A certain man was going down, and then the robbers go away. The second character comes on the scene. We have a certain priest, and he was going down, and he sees, but then he went by on the other side. So you see the same verbs being used here. The third character comes along, a Levite, and probably we're meant to fill in a certain one there as well. Upon coming to that place, seeing went by on the opposite side. So we've had three characters now who have gone down and then we have went away afterwards. We now come to the fourth character, a certain Samaritan was going down and seeing now, remember, we've had this going down and then went away. Now we get the Samaritan. The Samaritan comes down. He sees, but instead of going away, the story turns at this point. The verbal action switches, and it says he had compassion. He had pity. Now, let's just talk about the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan here for a second. The priest and the Levite come upon, they see, and then they go their other way. Now, if this man is in really dire situation, he could be dead. He could just be hanging on over there, and they may not know he's alive. From the lawyer's perspective, he might look at their actions and justify them based on cleanliness laws from the Old Testament. To touch a dead body would make you unclean. And these two people, the priest and the Levite, need to maintain their purity. However, during the intertestamental period, there's a number of Jewish texts that are written during that time, and perhaps the most important one for this study is the book of Tobit. In the book of Tobit, Tobias, the father, is often the Babylonian exile, and he is a righteous man because at night, remember there are slaves out there during the deportation, at night he goes out into the fields and the lanes and he looks for Jews that died during the day and then buries their bodies. So he's making himself ceremonially unclean, but he is showing mercy and pity to these bodies. In a certain extent, we would expect the priest and the Levite then to show mercy and pity. This might be challenging the lawyer's presuppositions that these are people of his guild, the people that he works with, the priest and the Levite, and he would expect them to show mercy and pity. 
the early Christian church and the Christian church throughout history has read this in sort of an anti-Semitic manner in that, oh, look at this, the priest and the Levite, these are bad guys. And so it's no wonder that they pass by and go on the other side. We would see them as bad characters. They don't have to be bad characters. In fact, they might actually be doing the right thing according to the law. We're not told of their motives. The key thing is the difference with the Samaritan. When the Samaritan comes along, he sees the person and he has a different reaction, that of pity. The other thing that we need to realize is that we call this parable the parable of the Good Samaritan. From the lawyer's perspective and probably most of Jesus' audience out there on the Galilean countryside, Samaritans were not good people. There was a fierce rivalry between the two. And to a certain extent, it was justified on the Samaritans' part. When you had the Maccabean revolt that takes place between 200 to 150 BC, when they get freedom from the Seleucid Empire, remember Antiochus Epiphany offers the pig on the altar and they starts this revolt in 168 AD. They take the area around Jerusalem, then they move north and they take the region of Samaria and then into Galilee. In the region of Samaria, what they do there is they slaughtered all the Samaritan priests and religious officials and they pulled down their temple at Shechem. So the Samaritans, for example, the woman that meet Jesus meets at the well in John chapter 4, she asks, you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. Our fathers said we should worship here in Samaria at Shechem. And she gets at the very heart of the issue there that this is what happened around 160 uh, BC. And it's something that goes on. They no longer have priests. They no longer have a temple that has all been destroyed during the Maccabean revolt. So there's a lot of tension between the two groups. When Jesus mentions the Samaritan as the third character here, the lawyer and the audience would not expect this person to show pity and mercy. Probably they would have expected him to go over and kick the body, see if the guy was alive, roll him over, see if there was anything left there for him to take as well. But instead, he has mercy upon him. The person we least expect is the person who shows mercy. Now, the way the story is told here, this man who has been robbed, beaten, stripped, and left half dead on the side of the road is at one location. Now we've had three people coming down the path. Now, what it lets us do is it lets us put all three people at the same location. So you've got the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan there sort of lined up like in a police lineup. And you've got this guy who's half dead on the side of the road. Now the question is, he has to pick his neighbor out from this police lineup. Is he going to pick the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? Now, for the lawyer, it would have been one of the first two. These were the people that he worked with. These were his community. To pick the Samaritan is the person that he would have least likely picked among those three to be his neighbor. And so the story sets up this very interesting space where we are in the position of the person that's half dead on the side of the road that now needs to identify who is my neighbor. With the action of the Samaritan coming along and having pity, all of a sudden, now the story turns. From the lawyer's perspective, this is the point where the story starts to get very, very strange. But notice what happens is in verse 33. It just doesn't stop with him having compassion. Notice at this point how the verbs change and also the piling on of the verbal action here. He goes up to him. He binds his wound. He pours oil and wine on him. He sets him on his own beast. He brings him to an inn. He took care of him. The next day, he takes out two denarii. He gives them to the innkeeper. And then we have the only word spoken in this whole story when he says, take care of him and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, the piling on of all these verbs and these actions here, I think does two things. The first thing is it's highly emphatic. The second thing it does is it forces us as readers or hearers to reevaluate our position. Here we have this person who is the least likely hero, rescuer in the whole story. It's going to take time to wrap our head around this. 
And as we're trying to do that, Jesus keeps piling on more and more verbal actions that this guy does. He doesn't just have pity. Look at all the actions he carries out here in regard to this poor guy. Now, I was saying that oftentimes when we interpret or read this story, we really domesticate it and bring the power of it down. We weaken the message of the story. When Jesus, at the very end of the parable, asks the question, which man was this neighbor? It forces the lawyer to take the viewpoint of the person on the ground who's naked and is beaten half to death. You can't answer this question as being the Levite, the priest, or the Samaritan. You have to put yourself down there in the dirt, naked, and beaten within an ounce of your life to be able to answer that question. That's the viewpoint we need to take in this parable. So when he asks, who was this neighbor? It forces the lawyer to assume that position. And here is how the story gets domesticated and weakened. If we read this parable as an example story, what it does is it puts us in a position over the person who's naked and half dead on the side of the road. We then get to decide whether we're going to show mercy or compassion on this individual, whether we are going to be compassionate about the immigrants coming from other countries here, or whether we are going to extend mercy to those less fortunate than ourselves. The parable doesn't let us do that. Instead of a position of standing over and making decisions about how we show mercy and who's going to be part of our community, it forces us to be underneath them. In other words, this guy laying there on the side of the road half dead and naked doesn't get a choice as to who his neighbor is. In the same way today, in order to really feel the punch of this parable, we don't go around reading this as an example story thing. Oh, I'm going to be a good Samaritan and help this person out. Rather, we need to be in a situation where we are under those who we despise the most and receive mercy, pity, and compassion from them. So we could put it this way. In order to correctly read this parable and feel the power of it, we need to take the viewpoint of the person who is half dead, beaten, and naked on the side of the road. And the focus of our viewpoint is on the three individuals that have come down. Which of these three is my neighbor? By assuming this viewpoint and the focus of the parable, it forces us to be under those that we despise, under those who we would not choose to be our neighbor or receive mercy from. And that's very interesting because now Jesus is going to ask him, which man was his neighbor? Now, because he doesn't get a choice here, he has to say the Samaritan. But notice what the lawyer says. He says, the man who showed compassion. He doesn't say the Samaritan. And I think that's kind of showing that he's still wrestling with the issues and the implications of this parable. What this means then is that if we're defining community like that, we don't get a choice as to who is in and who is out of our community. Now, immediately after the lawyer replies, the one who showed mercy, Jesus then replies, go and do likewise. Now, remember at the very beginning of the parable, after the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, do this and you will live. This statement here, go and do likewise, almost is parallel to that. You get this really nice book ending that Luke has recorded for us here in this parable. It gives us balance. The second thing is go and do likewise. What has happened is that the church tends then to read the parable of the Good Samaritan according to this commandment at the end. Go and do likewise. And the emphasis gets put on that. And as a result, then we read it as an example story. Be like the Good Samaritan. But the big question here is, in order to reach that point, you have to be like the person who is beaten, stripped, lying half dead on the side of the road, and then experiences community love from the person he least expects it from, the Samaritan. A friend of mine, Stanley Grunz, used to define community this way. He said, all too often we define community by drawing a boundary. 
And here's the, here's the boundary of our community. It's these lines or rules. And so it could be based on race or social economic or education or mental abilities or physical uh, handicaps or not having handicaps. What country we live in, whatever, we define these boundaries. And if someone doesn't meet all these criteria, they're outside it. And so they are no longer part of our community. The problem with that is you set up these really strong boundaries and then it limits or restricts our obligations to love one another as we love ourselves. Instead, what he said, we need to see the community of God instead of having a boundary around it, instead see it as a center. In, in other words, it's all the people who love God as they love themselves. They love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. This means then, because we're all pointing inwards and we're all coming together, that we can love one another as we love ourselves. And this is a great example with the Samaritan. This guy has godly compassion upon this person laying on the side of the road there. But if we define community based on religion or ethnic background, he would have been outside of it. This center is like a gravitational pull. It's like a black hole that's pulling everything into it. And if we see community based upon the center, who God is, and our worship and our love for God, then this makes community incredibly diverse. And this is one of the things I appreciate most about having had the chance to teach around the world, is that I get to worship with people in India and China and the Middle East and all over the world, and you get to see the incredible diversity of the kingdom of God, not only culturally, but linguistically, nationally, racially, everything. The kingdom of God is an incredibly diverse community, and it's one that we need to embrace based upon this central core of who God is and what he's done in history. In closing, I wanted to give you a heads up. Now, I'm working on a video right now also on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. How are these three related to each other? Are they kissing cousins or distant relatives? And why are these three so similar to each other and strikingly different from John? It's going to involve all kinds of special effects and graphics I've been working on, probably a blockbuster bigger than Star Wars. So stay tuned for that. Till then, remember to get out there and throw yourself on the side of some road, robbed and robeless, waiting for some despicable Samaritan to come along and rescue you. It's spiritually good for you. Till then, peace.